All right. Hello, my friends. My name is Aaron Gertis. It is Friday, September 20th, and we have a lot of news to cover today. So let's start here. 1,340 Russians off the battlefield, 20 tanks, 39 armored fighting vehicles, 35 artillery systems, 59 vehicles and fuel tanks. Now that 1,340 figure, that's a little on the high side. It's not abnormal, but it's on the higher end of what we've seen for the last about four months. Here are the losses that Andrew Perpetua could identify for today. Honestly, a lot of filler nonsense and I'm glad that he said that because I saw a lot here and I was like wow there's a lot and it's basically maybe a little bit better than one to one um, but it, it's like a lot like a motorcycle here uh, a car there a tr pickup truck there it's not a, it's not as much military vehicles as other okay so what happened last night shot down zero of three missiles uh, of a particular unknown type one out of one KH-59 cruise missile and 61 out of 70 Shahi drones. So that means that uh, about a dozen or so got through. Okay, in Russia, a military housing complex burned down in Engels. The city is a home to the strategic bomber military air base of the same name, often used in strikes against Ukraine. And you can see that there was some kind of fire there. Um, yeah. A cable manufacturing plant in Podolsk near Moscow is on fire, covering an area of nearly 5,000 square meters. I'm not sure how critical cable manufacturing is, but okay. I'm not sure that this is related, but it could be a uh, nation's largest mattress warehouse is completely burned down in Moscow. Now, a mattress warehouse could burn down in another city somewhere else, and it wouldn't be related to any war anywhere. So, you know, a cable plant may be more likely. Uh, lubricants, more likely yet. Um, a factory that produces armor plating, highly likely. Uh, a missile uh, depot, yeah, very likely. So you have to kind of weigh whether this is important or not. Okay, Jake Bro re reported yesterday that the Russian military is estimated to have lost over $200 million worth of missiles and ammunition after Ukraine successfully struck Torapets ammunition depot in Russia's Tver region. Okay. I didn't see any estimates myself, but I trust Jake has done his homework. This is Gary Kasparov saying you might have expected a Russian attack on a Ukrainian home for the elderly would attract special attention from the Biden White House. But apparently it's only an escalation when Ukraine needs to defend itself from such T attacks. This is extra large because I'm not showing the pictures below because it's just heartbreaking. Meanwhile, the Biden White House doubles down by saying that there's no one thing that we're going to do or not do that's going to make the game-changing difference in the war. I want to point out, and what the Secretary has said, you know, as someone that has, you know, significant experience on the battlefield and understands how these things knit together, the Secretary, whenever he talks about this, we've, you know, have been very clear. There's not, it's not a silver bullet. It's not one capability that's going to win the war or suddenly, you know, unlock something for the Ukrainians. It's how all the weapons, all the systems knit together and how the Ukrainians employ those together on the battle. And if you added this to the mix of those that were together, they would be stronger, not weaker. And that's really what it comes down to. Meanwhile, Russia is preparing dams around Belgorod in preparation for potentially a false flag operation. Russian troops are actively mining dams near Belgorod, likely in preparation for false flag operations in which Ukraine can be blamed for the environmental or humanitarian impact. Now, there's a quote here, and it's, it's worth looking at. Quote, this could be regarded as a bookmark for the future. If, for example, the situation changes dramatically and the Russians have to blow up dams to sh slow down the advance of Ukrainian defense forces, or possibly Russia is preparing for false flag operations at a hydroelectric facilities that uh, Ukraine can be blamed for in the subsequent environmental and human humanitarian impact. Okay, but again, while that's going on, Biden and Putin are actually looking like they're on the same side of the sh not allowing Ukraine to strike deep into Russia. It's very strange. Like the, Ukra the the European Parliament yesterday said, let them strike. But Biden 
is the only holdout. Now, somebody asked me in uh, a comment yesterday, I couldn't track it down. I'm going to go through a, just a video of comments to try to answer some things that you've said on here. But they said, Dr. Curtis, why did you come, become so partisan lately? I, I'm not partisan. I, I'm just saying, like, and they chastised me. They said, well, what about those Republicans that did this? Yes, six months ago, it was the Republicans who deserve to be chastised for holding up a bill for six months that they shouldn't have held up. Shame on them, especially Speaker Johnson for holding holding it up for so long. Absolutely 100%. But right now, the Republicans have zero impact on this. It is completely Biden. That's why I'm talking about Biden. That's the only reason. I try to be kind to even my adversaries, but you know, I, at a certain point, you just got to say, this is the reality. Okay. Meanwhile, Jen Stoltenberg is saying, the more weapons we give Ukraine, the sooner the peace will come. And I agree. I think that that's clear. You you have to um, force the end of the fight. And in the meantime, you're just allowing Putin to do more and more damage. Okay, let's turn our attention to Kursk. Kursk and the border operations, day four, or day 46. No sig significant movement from both sides in the past 24 hours. Zelensky reported about 40,000 Russian troops were diverted into the Kursk area. Okay, so I saw a figure that said, I thought it had his office saying 60,000. I could be wrong about that. I'm covering so much ground so quickly. It's it's hard to keep up. But it was 60,000, and that's five times more than the Ukrainians on the ground. Theoretically, it was 60,000. So you can do some quick math to figure out how many Ukrainians there are in the Kursk region. But now it's 40,000, so it's not one to one to five. It's, it's a better odds than that. And okay, that's where we are in Kursk. Okay, Anton Gurashenko, in Kornevo, Russia, Kursk region, there have not been armed forces of Ukraine for a day, but all the stores, gas stations, pharmacies, and surviving residential buildings have been opened and looted. Wait, but the Ukrainians aren't there. Well, you know, like a good neighbor. Collective appeal from residents of the Kurinetsky district of Kursk region to Putin starts with these words. The locals complain about mass looting, robbery, violence against local residents, theft of cars and agricultural equipment, and even the shooting of dogs that prevented Russian armed forces soldiers from entering buildings. Huh. So Russian soldiers are a danger to the Russian population. And here's the actual document. If you speak Russian and you want to look at it, you can see this document for yourself. It's pretty interesting what's being said here. Uh, and you can just you know pause what I'm saying and read through this yourself and just go back and look at the video. Okay. Next big story. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova claimed... And she's just making crap up here. She just claimed that Ukrainian forces have created, quote, concentration camps, unquote, in the Kursk region. Now, she's using that language intentionally, I think, because, you know, she's trying to you know, say that the Ukrainians are Nazis and sort of, and of course, the Nazis had concentration camps. Certainly, the Ukrainians are having these concentration camps in the Kursk region where local residents are forced at gunpoint into such camps. The bizarre mirroring effect of what the Russians do, they blame on the Ukrainians. Ukrainians is just, it's absolutely fascinating and it happens so often. She alleged that this affects those who didn't manage to leave those dangerous areas. Okay, let's turn our attention to Pokrovsk. So in Pokrovsk, Russians make marginal gains in several regions. The Ukrainians advance in Russia's Kursk Oblast near Pokrovsk, while Russia uh, is making marginal gains in Kharkiv, Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia Oblast. So let's look at this, um, this map. This is today on the deep state map. Here is Pokrovsk. Okay, so this is today. Here's two weeks ago. Here's today. Here's two weeks ago. What do you notice? They're not really making that much advance toward Pacross. They're like kind of doing things on the margins. And time is against them because they're they're really trying to take Pacross before winter. And I think General Winter is going to come to Pacross aid and they're they're so slow. Now, here's again today, two weeks ago, I was alarmed because this was two months ago. Look at that. And this was four months ago. Look at that. So four months, two months, two weeks ago. And like, I was like, uh oh, they're going to take per cross, it looks like. And today, it's unbelievable to see how it slowed down. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's what's happened. Okay. I was heartbroken when I heard from Paul Neeland in May 2024 that the suicide prevention hotline at Lifeline Ukraine had to pause due to a lack of funding. This breaks my heart. 
This happened at the peak of demand when the number of calls per month reached 6,500. Right? I mean, we have to fundraise for everything here. It's just, it's bizarre. Okay, in other news, Shaman, the Russian singer that sings, I am Russian, right? That, that, that popular patriotic song. Shaman has started to lose popularity rapidly. Patriotic singers don't sell anymore. Yesterday, the singer canceled a concert uh, scheduled for September 24th because few, too few tickets had been sold. A week before the performance, the vast majority of seats in the hall remained unsold. Another one on September 25th. And you can see like where the... People have bought seats and where they haven't. And that's pretty remarkable. How about that? Okay, the Pentagon announced that the remaining $5.8 billion allocated for aid to Ukraine will be used. The U.S. Department of Defense is seeking approval from Congress to extend President Joe Biden's authority to allocate these remaining funds later. But if they don't get it, they're going to make sure that they spend it before the end of September. President Zelensky has approved a number of staffing changes uh, to the Supreme Commander-in-Chief staff. I don't think there's anything to see here. Uh, people come and go and are added all the time. I don't think there's a big shakeup here. This is just uh, fleshing out the team. Meanwhile, Ukraine's innovative use of Javelin warheads on FPV drones. Okay, I saw an AK-47 or some kind of equivalent, Kalashnikov or something. Here they're add, adding uh, Javelin warheads to FPV drones. It's just remarkable how creative the Ukrainians are with this kind of thing. Now, meanwhile, uh, Katarov is pretty creative too. I mean, he's sending cyber trucks into battle, or so he says. Okay, Katarov is upset. He says Elon Musk has turned off his cyber truck that he equipped with a machine gun and sent to war. He says that it's not a manly thing to do. How could you do that, Elon? Katarov asks. Okay. But now he sent two more cyber trucks into the special military operations zone. Katarov said that the remote shutdown did not affect the other two pickup trucks, that they were operating normally and smoothly. The two cyber trucks shown in the video are equipped with weapons, as is the vehicle Katarov showed in August. The video also shows drones being shot down, and where and why is filmed is unknown. But I would love to see like some geolocation of where this actually this you know the firing is. The, the TikTok warriors are just insanely funny because they, they think that they're so tough and manly and they really, we know you're fake. Um, so it, it's fascinating. Like this, this uber masculine kind of look at me, I'm tough. It's the same thing with the presidential elections. Like I won by 98%. Nobody wins by 98%. That's fake and they can't see it. Okay. Uh, Finland. Could easily take this back. Somebody posted this that said, never forget what Russia's, Russians did to us. And here's territory that Russians stole from Finland in previous wars. And then here's Darth Putin talking about, on this day in 1951, the first deportations of Operation Ocean began. 20,000 Lithuanians were forcibly deported to Siberia as USSR continued to liberate them from fascism. Six years after World War II ended. Imagine mass deportations happening today. Imagine not doing everything you can to stop it. Now, there is another comment here too. We genuinely pretend we have no idea why NATO is so popular with the people that we did this to. <laughs> yeah, how about that? And you know, when they join NATO, NATO is expanding to the east. How to join a NATO country? Shake a hand, make an agreement. How to join Russia? Yeah. So that's the difference there. All right, my friends, thank you for your time. I'd, I'd appreciate your comments here. Um, People have been saying like, hey, the bottom's cut, cut off or um, that sort of thing. I'm trying to resize and make everything as clear for you as possible. Uh, I also tried desperately not to show the lines as I with my uh, with my cursor as I go through because some people periodically say um, you know hey that's distracting when you do that and some people do you like it do you not like it so I'm going to put out a poll on the cursor one and say do you, do you want me to follow it does it matter or is it you know distracting Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes. I'm going to answer a bunch of viewer questions in my very next video. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.